everybody for joining our webinar today. Uh, again, we're going to get started here right now. Um, it is going to be about increasing quality of service with DevOps. Again, thinking about continuous delivery. Wanted to provide you with a quick introduction of what Vivid is. For some of you, it may be the first time you're hearing about it. For others, you may be longtime members of Vivid. What it is is a unbiased and trusted field tested HP software user group providing an infrastructure of support through programs centered around education, community building, and advocacy for members. So this webinar being brought to you by the DevOps SIG or Special Interest Group and again one that we wanted to provide you as an educational opportunity. So leading the, the group are myself Todd DiCapua, also Paul Peisner, who's also on the phone uh, with us here today and will be one of the two presenters today. Again, you can see how you can join the DevOps SIG by going to the DevOps SIG page within the Vivid website. Again, that being vivid-worldwide.org. Um, so again, wanted to provide you this. We're always looking for new topics, always looking for speakers. Again, the ultimate goal here is to, to help grow and educate our community as things tend to evolve. Paul, I'm going to hand this over to, to you uh, for you to provide a little introduction of yourself, and then Nick, you as well. But both Paul and Nick do work for um, CollabNet. I've had the, the pleasure of knowing both of these gentlemen for at least five years now, and uh, each one play a key role not only within CollabNet, but also within the Agile cloud and DevOps community. So, Paul, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Hey, thanks everyone. I appreciate it. And I wanted to get started real quick with uh, just a, a quick um, overview. We're hearing a lot about Agile. We're hearing a lot about the cloud. And when you start putting those together, um, you create this environment and this culture where um, there's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of new opportunities for organizations to innovate, to streamline, to improve their efficiencies for um, the culture and the people um, to form processes of efficiency that are um, unique and, and profoundly different than what we've done in the past, but um, very simple to adopt and very quick to uh, adapt to the new opportunities that present themselves. So I'm, I'm very focused on the, the culture side of what's being created as the new technologies introduce themselves into this more dynamic business market. And Nick? Thank you, Paul. Yes, my name is Nick Rajani. I'm a senior solutions architect with CollabNet. I've been with CollabNet almost eight plus years. And today I'll be presenting some of the demonstration around the solution set will comprise three applications, the Team Forge, Continuous Integration, Jenkins, Build Server, and the HP Operations Orchestrator. And you'll see some of the synergies uh, within this environment. So over to you, Paul. Great. So today we're going to focus on the, uh, the increase of quality of service as people start to adopt a DevOps IT model. Um, and we're going to focus on a couple of technologies at the end of the presentation. But to get into it, we want to get into a, a little bit of kind of why this, uh, this topic and, and conversation is near and dear to both of our hearts, um, as well as to the community itself. Um, the good news about um, all the interest in, in Agile, Agile and the cloud is that it's a, it's an easy way to get started with a small group of people with a small project. The problem is at the enterprise level, if you're not coordinating these efforts with the IT operations team, um, there's a lot of hazards, there's a lot of potential for disaster, a lot of learning opportunities that are very painful and uh, hard to recover from. If you don't coordinate those efforts and make sure that the, the team um, of IT is working together to take advantage of, of all the innovations and all of the changes going, going on in the organization itself. So again, it's kind of skydiver issues that uh, get ugly at the very end if you're not dealing with it in the process on the way down. Um, one of the things we like to point out is um, in a different generation, IT was, um, it was acceptable to sit on the wall and criticize um, other disciplines within IT and to be cynical and skeptical. Really, the, the new future IT is, is more about a collaborative environment, working in, in teams, sharing the expertise and the knowledge needed to really drive a different type of IT asset for the business, um, one that's more responsive, one that's um, more streamlined, working more collaboratively, leveraging the knowledge of, of decades of learning experiences um, as team members and less about the silos of separated um, uh, duties. Also with DevOps, 
there's a real opportunity to rethink uh, a lot of the things that we do with um, our established IT practices, much like the, uh, the life cycle of our, our, our phones going from uh, hardwire mobile um, public phones to um, personal phones and then transitioning into mobile phones with internet access. A similar parallel is going on in the IT organizations where an understanding of what's really going on inside the whole process of IT is needed in every contribution. Um, and the larger contribution needs to be aligned with the business and the technology potential uh, so that IT is not working in a, in a bubble, but it's working collaboratively with the business to really produce what's needed out of the IT organization in this, in this new generation. So I know there's a lot of discussion about DevOps. I don't know, Todd, you got any uh, kind of summary statements or observations about what DevOps is? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. And I think, you know, probably, Paul, I, don't, I, don't, I know that I'm not the first guy in the world to ever do this, but I can say probably one of a handful that uh, was thrown into this back in 2006, so before DevOps was even a term. Um, again, I was leading a few organizations to transform them from waterfall to agile. And again, not just a development organization, but thinking about it from an enterprise perspective. And really starting in IT, you know, we, we started with development, which then integrated in the QA and test teams, and then ultimately fell on the shoulders of operations. And DevOps became something that was formed from the need caused as a result of this increased volume or velocity of feature function being delivered into operations and needing to ensure that, yes, there's quality there in what's being delivered and that these three teams are working together. And then I know one of the topics that Paul, you, and, and Nick are going to touch on today is that verification, validation that, okay, if it deploys and it fails, being able to, to roll it back. Again, a, a term that some people today are calling um, canary testing. So again, just wanted to, from a real world kind of firsthand experience, before DevOps was even a, a term, you know, it's something that I've had the opportunity to live through with two very large enterprise organizations. And again, that's the evolution that I've seen to to where we are ultimately today. So again, over the last. Yep. I think that you, uh, you, you kind of reflect a lot of the, the, the current thinking in the, the DevOps community. We've been doing a lot of this stuff already, and, and it's kind of getting shape and getting some structure around the conversation and more in depth with that, around the term DevOps. It seems to capture the, the idea of working more jointly together in a, in a more collaborative effort. The, the challenge I see with many of the DevOps community is the fact that they separate the conversations from what it's really trying to accomplish. So DevOps gives you a partnership with a business that allows you to adapt to the dynamic uh, environments that are constantly changing for the business, but it also allows you to adopt, experiment, and uh, try out new things from a technology perspective because the technologies are changing as well. Some of those technologies are giving us uh, huge advantages in terms of leapfrogging over um, many years of, of investment and discipline uh, activities. They're very expensive and we're absolutely needed in a waterfall era. But in this era of modern development, in many cases, um, those structures aren't necessarily needed to be segmented. They need to be blended in and the knowledge of the, um, of the previous generations need to be incorporated into the smaller groups to really make the, the IT a partner of the business and a competitive um, player in an industry that is constantly changing. So really, in, in, in my mind, the, the goal of DevOps is to really align both the, the pre-release activities, the operational activities, so that the business can be as competitive as possible to, to run as streamlined as possible, and really take advantage of a couple of things, both the collaborative uh, nature of, a, of a, a shared IT organization the integrations that pull platforms and products and technologies together um, that optimally get everybody working at the same speed but, but producing a quicker um, route to market from an IT perspective for the business, and then leveraging automation and cloud, which for, uh, in our minds really changed the game because some of the moving parts in the IT practices that are really managed by operations give development some advantages when all of those pieces are kind of lined up um, and then the, the standardization efforts, all of these things are kind of shaping up 
for a different type of environment. And we wanted to kind of work backwards and, um, and figure out what portions of IT could be optimized and be adapted so that the business can grow. And if you take a step back, we look at the, the three silos that have typically had tensions, the cultural tensions between each other, and the overall process flow that's, that's really required. Uh, this is a, a model that we use for, for leading discussions with the expectations that development adopting and adapting to Agile can move quicker. Um, the challenges IT uh, QA folks have with guaranteeing that those faster moving development efforts are of the same quality. And then IT operations concern that everything coming out of uh, pre-release efforts is, is oftentimes flawed and disrupted, disruptive every time you introduce something new. What we're talking about is a more coordinated flow that the risk levels are dropping, the disruption potential in all these applications are being reduced dramatically, and that the developers are constantly improving what they're working on so that what is being streamlined and rolled out more often is exactly what the business is looking for and exactly what operations can support. And given the metrics so that the QA expertise can, can overlook at the process and decide when it's acceptable or unacceptable with the risks that the project may bring to um, an organization. So, so as a uh, you know, as as a coordinator of conversations, what we end up doing is kind of walking through processes that um, people can relate to. And in in uh, in our area of expertise, Nick and I oftentimes will walk through established practices of many generations, many tools. And what we want to do is want to get to a high-level understanding of what's really happening in the pre-release efforts so that you can get your applications out into complex um, IT on-premise environments as well as um, strategies that have hybrid cloud. So the application needs to go through multiple steps to be able to be um, rolled out and used by the business as a service in operations. And what we've done is we've gone through um, some tactical steps and we want to talk about what's really changing and what the flow looks like. So we've created this model in which a project gets funded, gets developed, gets built, gets tested, and is ready for deployment into operations. Oftentimes, it needs to be flexible so that it's not just one development effort, but there are development efforts for legacy. Um, there's development efforts for applications in the cloud, for web apps, um, for, for environments that have e-commerce obligations. So while the development effort may have a lot of similarities, it may require adaptability to each one of the environments that you may be publishing to or that you may be pushing the asset out to um, and all the, the dependencies that go along with it. And what we're looking for is a, a high-level conversation with IT to understand what are the unique challenges within your environment um, so that DevOps can, can both address the needs as well as take advantage of the changing um, technology opportunities and to, to kind of monitor the changing markets that the business has to survive in. One of the really unique um, value opportunities for us is to work with HP Operations Orchestration Orchestrator. It's, um, it, it's more than a deploy process tool, but in our case what it does, it, it takes one of the moving parts that has been really difficult for development to um, to take into account, which is the deployment process. Oftentimes some of the smartest people in industry are deploying things out in very unique ways that uh, the application has to be layered on with um, deployment packages, uh, it has to make some changes to survive in the environment, and oftentimes that deployment process made the application unrecognizable to many of the development efforts. So there was always a strained relationship with the application release, the deployment process, and how it showed up in the um, operational environments as a service to the business. Um, the, the use of Operations Orchestrator enables the developers to really adopt objects, to bring those in and to set up a standardized process for deploying, uh, deploying applications that can also be rolled back gracefully if there should be a problem. Um, so it does speed up the effort. It takes some of the challenges out of the development effort and it does enable the business to have just a fewer moving parts and to be able to embrace a, a tool that can scale and sustain all of the flexible needed requirements for um, hybrid strategies of internal and external clouds, um, on-prem strategies, all of the legacy dependencies that need to be accounted for in many of the development efforts. Uh, this way, the, as the agile practice of, of deploying more often rolls out, 
Um, it's got a dependable and repeatable tool in Operations Orchestrator that um, can adapt and scale with the growing increases of releases and, and provide risk appropriate automation around those, um, those efforts. Uh, what we'd like to do is kind of walk you through um, both a, a manual, well, we want to walk you through a manual release process in which uh, a, a deployment tool has, a uh, deployment process has already been defined for an application at the requirements level. It was rolled into the, the development effort as an object. None of the activity within that development effort was of any risk to take it out of the automation track. And so uh, upon review and release, we're going to show you how it gets deployed out into a, we've got a, a private cloud demo where we're going to roll an application out there, and, and Nick's going to walk you through that. But what we want to do is just remind you that um, we're going to walk you through some of the screenshots and some of the processes, but this is a, a manual release that has automation tied to it. And, and again, with the culture issues, you've got separation of duty, you've got roles, and write, uh, roles um, that need to be defined. In this case, it would require that somebody in a specialty change management, release management, or QA role would be responsible for both releasing out the application and potentially rolling it back with a um, uh, canary testing environment. Um, and so it needs to have someone that is looking at the metrics that are, that are out there. So at this point, I'm going to let um, Nick walk us through the process with screenshots and then cut over for a live demonstration. Nick, are you there? Great. Thanks, Paul. Yes. Can you move to the next slide? So as Paul alluded to this earlier, uh, that uh, the demonstration you're going to see momentarily is going to comprise of multiple applications. Uh, TeamForge, uh, which is an application management system, is one. We have a continuous integration, Jenkins built server, and then HP Operations Orchestrator. So next couple of slides. We, we go through some of the screenshots. What you're seeing currently is a screenshot of a TeamForge application. TeamForge allows um, projects to be categorized into various categories. And so this enables uh, users to be able to search through projects very quickly. Next slide, please. The next screenshot actually shows a project page within CollabNet TeamForge. And this is the project portal page that allows or facilitates collaboration between various stakeholders, developers, testers, release managers. They all work within this page, and they can interact and collaborate and so on. Next slide, please. Here we see uh, a snap, a screenshot of Eclipse IDE, and CollabNet TeamForge is thoroughly integrated inside of Eclipse and Visual Studio both. This is a representation of Eclipse, and what it's showing you is all of the tasks and the requirements that come to the developer's desktop essentially is within the Eclipse environment where developers will make changes, and then there'll be associations between the code uh, and the requirement that they may be working on. And this is code committed to the Eclipse ID. You'll see some of the interactions momentarily. Next slide, please. This slide is a screenshot of Jenkins CI server. Uh, essentially, Jenkins CI is constantly polling for any changes that may occur that the developer is making as they, as they commit. And as the commit happens, the build server will, will begin and initiate a build. And this is a screenshot of that. Next slide, please. When the build, uh, upon a successful build, what happens is the build assets gets placed into what's called the CollabNet TeamForge's file release system. You'll see that momentarily, but at that point in time, because HP Operations Orchestrator is integrated with TeamForge, it actually picks up from our asset repository the content of the build and basically goes through a flow diagram. And this flow diagram is that representation. But ultimately, these assets get deployed into the cloud. In our example, you'll see the CollabNet Lab Manager as, as, as our internal cloud. But, but we can talk to various kinds of cloud offerings out there. The purpose being that these assets get deposited into a cloud and get provisioned on, on a stack. Uh, so, so there is continuity between the activities and development all the way 
following through into operations, which actually stands up a production environment, and this HPOO facilitates that. Next slide, please. This is a successful, this screenshot is depicting a successful run of the HPOO, um, and it is, and you see that momentarily as well, because it's always good to get feedback as the workflow executes, and this is that representation. Next slide, please. And finally, this is showing a, a success. A couple of things happen upon a successful run of the workflow. An event gets placed back into TeamForce that says, hey, the deployment is successful. The particular stack has been provisioned, provides you the location of that stack, and that concludes uh, validation, if you will, uh, of, of the success of an execution. This essentially concludes um, the screenshots. And our plan next is to show you a live demonstration. Um, so, so that's where we are at now. So if I can get control. Bear with me as we transition and I share my desktop. There we go. Okay, great, thank you. This is Todd. As, as we're transitioning here, all I would add is in the right-hand side, <clears throat> you should see a question window. Um, if you have questions that come up, I will be moderating those questions. We'll answer them at the end of the session today. So again, as you have questions that come up, please just input them there. Thank you. Great. So hopefully everybody can see my, my, uh, my desktop now. What you're currently seeing is the Team Forge as an application and a lot of the projects have been defined or placed into various categories. Teamforce gives you this flexibility. And what this, as a side benefit, is uh, one can begin to search and narrow down searches as you look for various objects that you can first search and then reuse. So right now, in, in one of our technology categories, we have a project defined, and I'm going to be sent into that particular project. So now you're actually seeing a project homepage and within the project homepage, this is where all of the stakeholders kind of collaborate. So one of the first things you may see is there are a whole bunch of requirements that may have come in from the business. So various stakeholders can actually look at these requirements. These requirements um, are constructed as user stories, and they are completely tracked within the Team Forge's environment. The other things that are tracked are, uh, for instance, the build. And you'll see in here, there's a build tracker. That means that every time uh, a build runs, uh, basically, um, uh, here's an event as an example of a tracker artifact. And upon a successful completion of a build and a successful completion uh, of an HPOO run, the state changes inside of TeamForge. HPOO basically gets all of the definition from TeamForge saying that I need to deploy to a particular cloud, um, and then uh, once that uh, run is successful, it basically sends an event back inside of TeamForge and says that this operation was a success. Okay. So let me uh, go back into the project. There are a couple of, uh, interesting couple of points that I want to make, again, around TeamForge. One is, um, as the builds get executed, they are packaged into the asset repository. And it's from this asset repository that HP Operations Orchestrator actually grabs this asset and then sends it for provisioning on an Amazon cloud. Uh, and then obviously we have the ability to monitor all the bills uh, that occur within the environment. So first things first, if you look at the project homepage, uh, there are a whole bunch of user stories that have, com that have come in. So as an Eclipse develop as a developer working inside of Eclipse IDE, these stories have come in, and on the right-hand side, you're actually seeing 
all of the artifacts that have come in for the developer to work on. So the developer makes you know a, a change uh, in in the code, obviously saves that piece of code, and then performs a commit operation. So I'll go ahead and commit. Upon a commit, um, what's going to happen is there's an association is going to be maintained between that task that the developer is working on and the piece of code. So once that commit happens, uh, there's traceability established. But besides that traceability, this is also going to uh, kick off a build. And we see a build kick off momentarily. But when, while that is happening, uh, we'll go take a look at uh, the HP Operations Orchestrator and talk about uh, the workflow that has been set up to communicate with Team Force. If you look at certain entry points within Team uh, between HP OO and Team Forge, uh, which which are depicted as follows, obviously there's an authentication that needs to happen because HP OO needs to get authenticated inside of Team Forge, and then uh, it gets all of the relevant information, which is uh, exactly it needs to find out where that payload is because as a consequence of a successful run, it will pick up the payload from the file release system. It will walk through all of these steps and ultimately will go deposit uh, those assets into a, uh, into a cloud, uh, into a system provisioned in a cloud. Uh, I just switched the screen. Um, again, this shows of a, uh, an execution of an earlier run that had occurred. And in this particular run, um, as the provision occur, as the provisioning uh, of a system occurred, an event got sent back into Team Four, stating that there was a complete success. So let's go back into Team Four and look at the consequence of this successful run. Before we do that, though, let's just look at the build and let's just look at the build and test, and you'll see that there is a build that got triggered as a consequence um, of the code commit that I made earlier. So we will wait uh, for this build to get completed. Uh, and what's going to happen upon completion, it's going to go deposit that asset in what we call the file release system, right? But let's, uh, in the interest of time, look, oh, uh, interestingly, this build did get completed. And now, as a consequence of this build, if we go into the file release system, this build got deposited and I got an email notification here as well. Uh, and if we go inside this package, and inside this package there's a game of life, release 1.1, and within this here, a game of so this war file got deposited, which is 9.30 a.m. Pacific time or 12.30 East Coast time. So HP Operations Orchestrator now will go uh, into this particular file release system, grab the assets, uh, and do the successful and go through the execution of the workflow. Oh. So upon a success of that workflow, um, what happens is inside of Team Forge, this event gets tracked, and then the artifact uh, gets closed. So if you look at what just transpired, uh, we go open that artifact, and the state gets changed to closure. And in here, um, it says it moved the file package into a cloud. In our case, it's our Collab and lab manager and the state changes to a closed state. So in other words, just to conclude, uh, what transpired is this entire execution of this workflow occurred and that uh, essentially uh, kind of aggregates um, what we call within DevOps, the aggregation of development activities, with build activities, and with uh, HPOO. This concludes uh, this live presentation of the demonstration. And I'll turn this over to you, Paul. Excellent. All right. So there's a lot of questions out there about, um, you know, are there organizations today, global organizations, that are leveraging the technologies together? And um, we do have a success story, a company in the States known as DHL, out in Europe known as Deutsche Post. It's a very large organization, 500,000 employees. Um, they've got um, close to 300 projects running simultaneously in, in an agile methodology, a lot of outsource participation, a lot of internal um, QA requirements. It runs 
very integrated with the HP Quality Center solution set. It leverages HP Operations Orchestrator. Um, and they're able to reuse a lot of the, the code development work, the knowledge from the, the development teams as well as the IT organizations. Their innovation cycles are running at 70% uh, faster than, than when they had a waterfall-based uh, process. And they had a tremendous amount of money spent on disruptive responses to uh, negative impacts in the data center as well in their cloud environments. So they've seen a dramatic increase in the quality of their activities and also the, the innovation cycles being dramatically reduced. And it has translated into a, a lot of unspent IT money that now is um, freed up to really invest in new innovations that, that are um, responding to the changes in the marketplace as well as um, the changes in the technology that the IT teams can now explore and, and kind of uh, make dramatic jumps. So we've got more information on this. We've recorded a webinar with them. If you're interested in, in going back and, and uh, understanding how DHL has used this to kind of transform their organization at the uh, R&D level and the innovation cycles, we'd love to kind of walk you through that, that story. Um, what we've done here um, to kind of help facilitate the discussions, there are two topics we'd like to bring up. Um, when you're framing a DevOps conversation that are new specific to this area. One of them is uh, what we call canary testing. The other one is deployment as code. And to, to really describe what both of those kinds of conversations are about, um, based on the demo that Nick did, what I'm going to do is just kind of abstract this out, uh, step back a layer, and just to talk about what's really going on when IT makes these kinds of changes in industry is, from a developer perspective, um, there's very few organizations that are really taking advantage of the learned opportunities with their developers when they're globally distributed. So creating an architecture in which that knowledge, the community, the, the resources, the code reuse strategies all can be um, brought in to improve the, the development practices. But likewise, operations is constantly changing and making um, business a, adjustments to, um, to stay relevant in the, to the business that they're serving. And those changes aren't aren't systematically being synced up with um, the development requirements pieces. Also, the business is making changes like jumping out to the cloud, um, building internal cloud uh, strategies. And oftentimes, those are surprises to projects that are in flight, not anticipating that, and really lining up and syncing up the resources of IT so that operation changes and development um, activities simultaneously see each other's environments is absolutely critical and, and really a need for DevOps. And the last piece is when you're rolling out the deployments, a lot of the, the development effort needs to include both um, the, the packaging of how this application needs to be rolled out into a supportable environment, also the strategies to roll things back. If, it, if it's a failed effort, if there's negative impact, um, how do you roll that back gracefully and how do you test for that? How do you run a QA process so that you're not just finishing the app, but you're finishing the service, the serviceable, the service as well as the delivery of it with all the strategies that you need to have in place to really run an enterprise uh, conversation. And it's no wonder that you know, as much as 80% of the historic deployments and release efforts were considered a failure in their first efforts in, in uh, enterprise environments. Um, that's been a real challenge and a heavy criticism and a real driver for the need for DevOps. Really, when you go for, from an application in perspective, what we're seeing is um, optimization of code reuse, of, of collaborative knowledge sharing, of role-based access to all the resources you need to be productive, um, the capturing of artifacts through the whole life cycle of the application so that it can influence the developers in the earliest stages. The adoption of infrastructure as code, being able to see the infrastructure that, or the deployment target as, a, um, as part of the, the development team because it's a changing environment that needs to be accommodated for in the development effort. And there's many innovations in that space. There's, uh, you know, just Humboldt wrote, wrote a book on uh, the whole infrastructure as code. And really what we're proposing here is kind of a, a deployment as code strategy in which the, um, the deployment tools and the runbook technologies in the operation space definitely are benefiting the, the developers by giving them um, objects that they can include in their project efforts that include responsibility for the release um, as well as the rollback potential that might be required for all the development efforts. And it gives a, a specialty role for QA to jump in and to really test um, the non-moving parts to see the risk in the application development environments 
both with automated tests as well as manual testing. You can wrap those up into an agile practice. When all of the parts and pieces are, are known and they're not moving around, and this is really the, um, the environment that we're trying to create, what we call framing the DevOps discussion, is finally getting all the moving parts to sit in place so that the development teams can have as much transparency out to operations as possible and then make those decisions that are best for the business. So that's kind of the, um, the last slide. Uh, obviously, there's, there's lots of discussions we can have. We'd be happy to, to kind of talk about the products that we're, we're demoing here or that we're aware of. Um, we've got integrations and demos that we can walk you through where um, the Ops Code Chef environment, the HP Cloud Services, um, publishing to Amazon, these are all uh, real demos that we can run for you if you're interested in how this would work, if you're running out to server automation, I know some of the folks on the call here include uh, some of HP's uh, product management teams, product marketing solutions architects, and they would love to kind of walk you through how you can craft a, a solution set um, that is right for your business. So with that, I was going to kind of um, open it up for Todd to see if there's any questions out there, to see if there's um, any discussion points or anything we want to address. Yeah, right now, I, again, please keep adding questions. We've got three questions right now that I can see. Um, the first one, again, Paul, I'm not sure if it would go to you or to Nick, but I think having this slide up, it's probably a relevant one to start with, is is Operations Orchestrator the only HP software being used? And there's a couple other products that the person mentions. Uh, the guy's name is Steve. Um, is HPSA, DMA, or CSA also being used? So that's a great question. So what we're talking about is a developer's view of the changing environments. The tools that HP has are really a best practice to help you see the infrastructure as code to a development team so that pre-release can have as much visibility out there. Um, SA and the, and the discovery tools are absolutely critical to knowing your assets, knowing the environments, understanding the changes that are constantly dynamically going on. So we're not we're not focused on what you need to, to run an operations best practice. What we're focusing on is making sure that deployment um, or development is not disrupting your, your environment, but is blending in and as much visibility and however you use those tools to understand your environment. Those are brilliant tools. They help us as developers roll out more gracefully and we make the deployment less disruptive and we take a lot of the risk out of it. So again, we don't look at the target. Um, locations or those environments, what we look at it, the target as a, as a known uh, location and the ability to deploy out there with a high probability of success and, and less risk out there. So we love the SA tools from HP. We love the um, discovery tools. Um, we love the HP uh, ALM product sets. They, they definitely blend in. We've got integrations that, that keep us in sync with our, um, our um, QA and our quality and our test environments that are appropriate for each of the organizations. So yeah, those, those operation tools are absolutely critical in a working solution. What we're looking at is just kind of how do you view this in such a way that you pull your teams together and you just need a high level vis uh, visual and that's what this represents. Great, and I also, in the same Q&A window here, um, Munir had chimed in to say that um, OO does plug into these solutions and can drive them as well. So yep. it sounds, you know, that even yeah, from an HP perspective, the integration's there. Right. We, we really rely on the OO tool to make sure that we're not disrupting. And it really is what is being tested out there. So HP provides um, so much of the infrastructure stack that is invaluable to having a, um, a best-of-class IT environment. And I guess Paul, I, I know that in preparation for this, you said that um, I could mention a little bit about Shunra, and of course I don't want to make it a commercial, but you know, as a, a Scrum practitioner and an Agile person, always thinking about the piece that you mentioned and, and looking at the demo that Nick did, you know, you're committing this code, again, how is it that we're running a lot of the, the automated testing, and how is it that we're recreating these environments, again, I work for Shunra. Um, recently, an OEM agreement with HP, but again, we've been working with Mercury and HP for the last 10 plus years. So, really, looking at that ALM ecosystem, 
Chandra brings that ability now to recreate that production environment where leveraging these other tools like DMA will allow you to bring that distributed nature into your, your test environment. And I've even brought it into some of my early stage um, development integration environments or other people call them uh, BVT, build validation test environments, to run my automated functional and performance tests under real world test environments or what looks like your production environment. So again, as you're hearing about DevOps, again, it's the development, it's the QA, the testing, it's the operations teams. It's bringing some of these proven tools together, integrating them to have this enterprise solution that can do it all end to end, fully automated. Right. And Chandra playing a role in that as well. We got a, another question here that's pretty pretty general. Um, and Nick, it might be a good one for you. You know, how complicated is HPOO to deploy and learn? Um, I guess to you know, there's there's basic capabilities and then there's some more advanced. But I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. There's another question that I'm seeing here. Yeah, sure, Todd. Glad to. I. Um uh, I was able to install and set up HPO rather quickly. I, I think it was a matter of an hour or less in, in actually installing it and, and getting the basic configuration. Uh, there was some, some amount of work obviously involved in, in using the APIs to communicate with TeamForge. But again, all the APIs were documented uh, very nicely. So uh, providing the integration or building the integration with TeamForge was not uh, difficult either. Uh, the workflows uh, are all pictorial, obviously, so they help you guide through the process, and obviously you can save and version them. So those are some of the additional benefits of, of using this this workflow. So uh, it was, uh, you know, I'm going to say, uh, not a painstaking process at all in, in setting up the environment and actually doing some of the integration work. And I think that HPOO comes with a library of, of value because it's got the, the um, connectors and the integrations to all of the HP products as well to as many of the industry standard environments that you're going to be deploying with. So it comes ready made and ready to integrate um, once you understand how your process is going to feed into that system. For us, you know, operations orchestrator is really the deployment as code option because it gives you so much flexibility in the back end to deploy out gracefully. Excellent. Thank you both, Nick and Paul, for that response. Sure. I was always looking for more questions. I've got one last one here. Um, does HPOO and the CollabNet TeamForge meet SOX and PCI compliance obligations? Yeah, um, so... Go ahead, Nick. Well, I don't know if you, if you want to take that. I, I can only comment on, on a couple of things, Todd. One is you know, one of the SOX compliance uh, criteria, obviously, is the audit trails, right? Um, and, and therefore, there is constant audit trails between all of the activities that uh, evolve from development through build and into operations. So all of this gets logged and obviously can be queried upon and reported, again, uh, reported against, for sure. So, you know, I'll comment to that piece. Uh, the other component is, is the governance piece, right? So there is the, the role-based um, access control provided uh, such that, hey, if you are a developer, perhaps you should not be allowed to deploy uh, into production operations. Only production operations people can do that. So those kinds of governance controls are, are also there. So uh, uh, audit trails and governance are, are, are just two very key and fundamental uh, to this integrated solution. Yep, I, I, I would agree. I think it's reportable, it's, it's auditable. I think um, the version control and the rules-based access that, that the CloudNet Team Forge tool works in conjunction with the standardization capability of Operations Orchestrator allows you to create um, deployment strategies that, that are as compliant as the development activities. Um, you, you, can, you can roll out as often, um, you can have policy-driven capabilities with your deployment strategy. So, for us, we, we see the, the coordination of deployment along with our application development effort being the completed uh, 
I guess it addresses the vulnerability that oftentimes development feels when it deploys out because of the, the needed rights to make changes on the fly on the deployment process. Um, it just has fewer people touching things, and it, it allows the, the workflows and the policies to drive things out more gracefully. So yeah, it's actually easier to report against and, and actually more compliant um, out there. One thing that, that I wanted to bring up um, for the, the folks on the, on the call here is a cloud that when we approach the organizations that are looking at um, how to optimize uh, around DevOps, we, we really put it in the context of what an organization is doing, whether they see the cloud as an advantage, if they're embracing it, um, if they're looking at their, their global developers as a community that needs to be enabled, that needs to be more collaborative, um, what are you doing to set up the, the architectures to, to bring that knowledge and those um, shared experiences of the whole IT community together? Um, and then what are you doing to, to kind of codify or set standard processes so that um, when something does go wrong, you can either fix the internal um, application or the external processes that surround that application so that you only have two moving parts and you've got something to fix every time there's an opportunity to learn out there. And then when you have all of those those processes defined and you've got new standards, then orchestrating DevOps so that you can flow as quickly as the business can um, can make requests, you can innovate and deploy those out at the maximum efficiencies. There's huge opportunities in um, in leveraging DevOps as a means to an end, and that re that end is really how do you optimize organizations with their um, on-prem investments and their desire to expand into the cloud with hybrid strategies, uh, CloudNet stands at a place where um, we're ready to accelerate the, um, the deployment processes, or the innovations that are, are coming in, um, as long as the organization as a whole understands its responsibilities and its potential to coordinate the resources so that the, the business is given its opportunity to have a competitive advantage. So I think we, we walk through something that we call an enterprise cloud de development discussion so that you're not investing in a silo that's going to be held hostage to another discipline in IT. And the stair-step discussion can happen anywhere at any point, but we just want to make sure that from, a, a, from an internal cultural perspective that all of the resources needed to be efficient and to be productive are being invested in. There's, there's no silver bullet. There's just what is optimal for your business environment and the way you want to drive things. Um, that being said, you know, CloudNet is all about helping um, organizations embrace cloud, embrace uh, the agile methodologies to be more um, competitive in, in the markets that they serve. Um, and we've got a number of resources as well as an, an educational survey that we have out there just to kind of help people understand um, what are some of the drivers, what are some of the potential changes, where are the areas that, that DevOps is really embracing. Uh, Vivit has a special interest group. Uh, where Todd and I kind of manage and facilitate those discussions. We'd love to have more questions in there. Um, there's a number of free webinars as well as educational pieces that CloudNet has that, you know, if you're interested in, in doing a self-service or self-assessment, we're happy to help you go down that path to figure out what, what is kind of struggling in terms of your processes and what you might do to, to optimize a particular um, practice or how you might optimize um, the whole system as a system-wide feedback loop. So we'd be happy to walk you through that, that whole process. Um, again, we're an open source community. A lot of our tools are free. We'd love to help you explore and invest your time and resources into optimizing IT in, a, in adopting an IT DevOps model. Um, and, and whatever that means and whatever is most challenging for you, we'd love to help you address that as well. Todd, do you have anything? Yeah, I guess you know, one of the things I would add Paul is, uh, you know, you talk about being an open source community type company, and I know when you and I first had the chance to meet <clears throat> several years ago, you said, oh yeah, one of our biggest tools is Subversion, and I said, you've got to be kidding me. I'm like, you know, you guys sponsor that product? Oh yeah, that's what we do. So, you know, it's, you know, an organization like CollabNet partnering with Vivit, again, it's, it's a, a very easy connection. So, again, Vivit, out trying to help the community educate people on very relevant topics. Um, an organization like CollabNet bringing these capabilities to help within DevOps, help with even some of the topics like canary testing, and enabling these pieces end-to-end -end in an automated fashion, which 
again, I almost call it that stair step, is that maturity model that, that we watch organizations go through. And it may be that you are at stair step one or two, needing to leverage a product or a capability like what ColabNet offers. So again, I would encourage you to, if you want to get more information, you can see some of the links here. Um, I know that um, you know we are going to also make this available on the Vivid website. Um, I know that a number of people just being on this call have already joined the DevOps SIG specifically as well. Um, but we're, again, constantly looking for new ideas, new topics. Um, the only other piece, I guess, that I would add to all of this conversation, a number of people I know are going to be going to the HP Discover event in Frankfurt, which will be next week. Um, I will be there as well. Um, I know that, uh, unfortunately, Paul and Nick both had conflicts preventing them from being able to go this year. But um, again, I'll be there. Look forward to, to meeting any of you um, as you would have questions. I could probably be found in the Vivid area, more than likely easily tracked down at the, the Shunra booth um, itself. So that's everything I've got. Um, Nick, Paul, I don't know if you have any other comments, if you wanted to share you guys' contact information. Sure, I think our, our contact information, you can get it from the Vivid community itself if you want to click on it. I think our, our emails are, are there as well as our phone numbers. Uh, from a culture perspective, I mean, there's no silver bullet. There's no technology that will get you there. Um, it's going to be different and adaptable in uh, your markets that you're serving. Um, and, you know, I'm a big person, that, a big, big advocate for um, educating the community as well as investing in the infrastructure that, that needs to be optimized and that the, the expertise of all the IT disciplines need to be embraced and leveraged. Otherwise, you're just going to go through a whole new learning curve um, by cutting out a, a discipline or, or missing a practice that has um, served the IT community for, for a generation or more. It's absolutely critical that we embrace all of the knowledge and all of the expertise. Nick, do you have anything? No, I think I'm good. You guys have summarized it really well, Paul. So thank you. Thanks, Todd. All right. Hey, thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it, and hopefully we'll see you on the, uh, the DevOps SIG. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.